brand new poll taken just days after the devastating earthquake and tsunami in Japan, and it finds that nearly 40% of those surveyed believe that the disasters that we have been seeing are a sign from God. Well, the poll released by the Public Religion Research Institute found that when it comes to natural disasters like the earthquake in Japan and the devastating tsunami, nearly 4 in 10 Americans believe it is a sign from God. While it may be true that earthquakes are devastating and terrifying events, there is definitely nothing supernatural about them. For example, it is a well-documented fact that the entire nation of Japan lies squarely on top of a major subduction zone caused by the intersection of no less than four tectonic plates. It is therefore no surprise that the Japanese people have been forced to suffer through dozens of severe earthquakes and volcanic eruptions throughout their recorded history, and it should come as no further surprise when just as many earthquakes and volcanic eruptions continue to occur in the future. It is, after all, the natural behavior one should expect when given the geological conditions below. It simply cannot help but happen. So why is it that so many people will happily attribute such events to the wrath of some mysterious deity when there is an obvious natural cause? Consider the following experiment. I am going to show you a movie. As you watch the movie, describe what you see happening. Ready? Let's begin. Well, let's see. There appears to be a triangle moving around inside of a rectangle. Now a circle and a little triangle have entered the scene. Uh, the big triangle has exited the rectangle. A uh, piece of the rectangle appears to be hinged. Uh, the triangles are colliding with each other. Circle has just moved towards the rectangle and is behind the hinge and a corner of the rectangle. Big triangle and little triangle are colliding some more. The circle is exited and entered the rectangle again. Triangle is now underneath the rectangle. The big triangle is moving around chaotically on the outside of the rectangle. In short, a bunch of geometric objects enter the scene, move around for a while, and then leave. How much simpler could it get? It should therefore come as no surprise whatsoever when over 95% of subjects describe the footage in the exact same way, right? Well, actually, yes it should. If you are like most people, this movie probably feels like more to you than mere cardboard cutouts undergoing stop-motion animation. For example, you might suppose that Big Triangle and Little Triangle are engaged in some sort of conflict, Little Triangle and Circle are apparently friends, or maybe even lovers, perhaps you think that Big Triangle is a bully or a jealous husband. Yet despite this apparent perception, the movie is still nothing more than lifeless geometric objects moving around on a screen. This is a phenomenon called anthropomorphization. Not only will most people describe these objects in terms of animate creatures, but many of us will even come to perceive them as actual human beings complete with a full set of emotions, motives, genders, personalities, and backstories. In fact, this perception is so universal that failure to do so can almost be considered a sign of brain damage. For example, autistic subjects who view this same animation will generally describe it more in terms of geometric objects rather than motivated characters. Similar results have also been reported in the victims of severe head trauma. Personification of the external world is therefore a ubiquitous facet of human nature with deeply seated roots in our socially focused neurology. Most of us cannot help but exhibit this behavior and it is important to recognize this fundamental bias in our perception. So what does all this have to do with earthquakes? Recall from part 8 of this video series that many human beings possess high levels of need for cognitive closure. That means whenever some event cries out for an explanation, the natural tendency is to latch on to whatever answer happens to come along first. However, as we have just learned from the Hyder and Simmel experiment, a very pervasive tendency among people is to spontaneously perceive the world in terms of deliberate, emotionally motivated characters. The net result is therefore a process called agenticity. When when confronted with a mysterious and dramatic event like, say, an earthquake in Japan, there exists a strong urge to fill the void of uncertainty with the conscious actions of human-like agents. Now, armed with this new appreciation for a common bias in human perception, let us examine one of the more commonly used arguments for God's existence. In 1802, theologian William Paley presented one of the best-known expositions of the design proof. But suppose I found a watch upon the ground, and it should be inquired how the watch happened to be in that place. I should hardly think of the answer which I had before given, that for anything I knew the watch might have always been there. 
Arguments like these can come in a wide variety of forms, but are all generally part of a larger class known as teleological arguments, or simply arguments from design. These arguments are wildly popular among religious apologetics, even though a casual scrutiny immediately exposes serious flaws. For example, one variation will argue that the fundamental constants of the universe itself must have been finely tuned because slight perturbations to these constants would prevent the emergence of life. Aside from the fact that this is obviously nothing more than a classical God of the Gaps argument, cosmologists have already refuted the premise entirely. One famous study has even demonstrated a perfectly feasible universe, complete with heavy elements and carbon-based chemistry, in the total absence of a weak nuclear force. Worse still, it is hard to imagine how our universe is supposed to be fine-tuned for life in any meaningful sense. Between the cosmic shooting galleries of meteor impacts, cosmic radiation, volcanic activity, black holes, and supernova explosions, the universe seems far more interested in snuffing out life altogether rather than helping it flourish. The entire argument is literally predicated on the existence of some cosmic uber fairy with the power to precisely define the intrinsic laws of nature to his is very choosing, yet completely happy with the vast, overwhelming majority of his own universe being completely hostile to the very thing it was allegedly designed to support. In short, the real question we should be asking is not who designed the universe. Rather, a far more compelling question is, why are teleological arguments so freakishly popular? Consider the following experiment. This is a pencil. It was made by a human for the express purpose of writing. This is a pencil sharpener. It was also made by a human for the express purpose of sharpening pencils. These, however, are pencil shavings. They have no purpose. They are not made for anything. It is just a pile of stuff that is there. Maybe someone can use it for something, but it is not made for anything. Is this distinction clear? Good. You see this? This is a tiger. Ben says a tiger is made for something. It could be that it's made for eating and walking and being seen at the zoo, or it could be that it's made for other things. But Ben is sure that a tiger is made for something, and that's why it's there. Jane says that this is silly. A tiger isn't made for anything. Even though it can eat and walk and be seen at the zoo, that's not what it's made for. They're just things that it can do or people can do with it. Jane is sure that a tiger can do many things, but they aren't what it's made for and they aren't why it's here. Point to who you think is right. Ben, who thinks a tiger is made for something, or Jane, who thinks that's silly because a tiger isn't made for anything. Once you finish with the tiger, repeat this little game using pictures of anything else you can think of. You can use clocks, noses, bunnies, bicycles, anything you want. Just be sure that buried within your pictures are examples of natural objects with no meaningful function. For example, you might want to include a mountaintop. In every literal sense imaginable, this object is nothing more than a pile of dirt and rocks that happen to rise up as a result of geological forces. It has no purpose whatsoever and only came into existence through purely aimless, random, natural causes. Surely, no grown-up would be silly enough to assign deliberate design to completely natural objects, would they? Wrong. When administered to young adults, it is perfectly common for 30% of the responses to agree with the made-for-something position while viewing perfectly natural objects. This perception of design is even greater when presented with biological organisms like tigers and rabbits. Yet in all frankness, a tiger has no more intrinsic purpose for existing than a mountain does. Tigers are, after all, nothing more than the end result of a long chain of inherited allele variations in reproductive populations subject to natural selection. So although such a process is certainly capable of producing complex structures with apparent survival advantage, there is no meaningful purpose to this any more than there is with geological forces as they pile up a mountain of dirt. Now, let's shake things up a bit. The mere fact that these numbers are anything other than zero is interesting enough on its own, but that's still only half of the story. To make things even more interesting, go and get yourself a group of five-year-old children and then repeat the entire experiment with them. Surely, the uncorrupted minds of young children will not be so prone to teleological thinking, would they? Wrong! 
In actuality, young children make very little distinction between the alleged purposes of man-made artifacts, biological organisms, and completely natural objects. This makes teleological thinking a pervasive bias in human perception that is virtually hardwired into our neurology at birth. It is only through years of disciplined education and real-world experience that such perceptions tend to diminish. So what does all of this have to do with teleological arguments? Here's how it works. As we have already shown, agenticity is a process whereby human beings tend to infer the existence of deliberate agents as the ultimate movers and shakers behind events in our environment. A natural product of this perception is the general tendency to see objects in the natural world as being deliberately designed for some ultimate purpose, even when most of these objects demonstrably serve no purpose at all. This perception is especially ubiquitous among children and only tends to disappear as people get older and wiser. Consequently, the teleological argument for God is, in a very literal sense, childish. It has no empirical basis whatsoever and serves only as an appeal to our intrinsic perception of causal agents that influence the world around us. When I think of the incredibly rich complexity of things, the incredibly complicated workings of things, and then the, the massiveness of all of it, I find it impossible not to believe that it was God who brought this about. Um, I can try as a philosopher to articulate that carefully in terms of arguments and premises and so forth, but, but, it, but it doesn't arise for me like that. It's an existential response to the experience of the world. So are earthquakes and tsunamis really a sign of divine retribution against sinful mortals? Is the universe really fine-tuned for the express purpose of supporting life? Or are these concepts merely the cognitive manifestations of a tendency to perceive human characteristics in otherwise perfectly natural phenomena? There is in this universe much of what seems to be design, but instead we repeatedly discover that natural processes, collisional selection of worlds, say, or natural selection of gene pools, or even the convection pattern in a pot of boiling water, can extract order out of chaos and deceive us into deducing purpose where there is none. But knowledge is preferable to ignorance. Better by far to embrace the hard truth than a reassuring fable. If we crave some cosmic purpose, then let us find ourselves a worthy goal.